Hello everyone, this is Carl with Lunchbox Sessions and welcome to our class on PWM, Pulse Width Modulation. That's a mouthful, but it's really just a simple trick used in electronic control circuitry where we turn the voltage fully on, turn it off for a time, keep repeating that many times per second, and we can do many clever things with it from dimming lights to controlling motor speeds. And let's start with a, a really heavy duty example from hydraulics. I'm just going to turn on the pump here. We'll see that I've got a oscilloscope watching over our pulse width modulation signal. Here I've got a pressure valve that is regulating hydraulic pressure that's pushing on the left hand of those two spring-loaded hydraulic cylinders. And as I turn the control knob for the amount of pressure or spring compression that I want, what you will see is that the pressure is changing. Pressure's coming down, pressure's coming up, and we're using pulse width modulation. A change in the duty cycle or the width of the top of that waveform, 55% duty cycle at the moment. I can reduce that duty cycle and find out that our spring tension is relaxing. So that's a big heavy duty industrial example and I've got a good number of other examples to show you. The bench top is just covered with gadgets today but let's switch over to working with lunchbox sessions and in the waveform session I'm going to pick the simple PWM dimmer switch. Dimmer switches I think we can all relate to. You've surely encountered one. Maybe you have one in your dining room at home. Here we have an example of a dimmer switch being used in a workshop environment. Our light fixture on the wall there. Maybe it can be a lot brighter than it already is. We just have to get our worker there to push up on that dimmer switch slider and find out that we can raise the level of lighting in the room. Too bright, maybe our worker's not in great shape, doesn't want bright lights today. Turn it right down to a low lighting level. And that's being done if you're watching the scope meter, which shows us a graphic depiction of voltage on at full value versus voltage off. We can see that there is a duty cycle or a percentage that's very important. So I'm right close to 50% duty cycle and you can see that about half the time our voltage is full value. The light is fully on. The other half the time the voltage is zero and the lamp is off. And if we, if we have that happening full on half the time, full off the other half the time, our lighting level in the room is about half of the brightness that's available to us. Now you might be saying, hey, I don't see the lamp flickering. Well, that's good. That could be very irritating. And the reason you don't see the lamp flickering is that complete waveform of high and low or on and off, that's being repeated many times per second. How many times? Well, when you look below that little 50% mark on our scope meter, it says 120 HC. 120 hertz. That means the complete cycle of our waveform, the, the full voltage and the zero, is being repeated 120 times per second. It's too fast for our, for our eyes to catch that, and so it just looks like the bulb is dimly lit when in fact it's being turned on and off. Let's switch to slow mode, slow mo, and see what's happening if we slow down to 1 150th of real time and you'll be able to see that little bright white laser beam tracing along on the waveform on the scope meter perfectly synced up to when the lamp is on versus when the lamp is off. It's really not any more complicated than that. This is an application of course for driven loads. Driven loads are things like light bulbs, electric motors, valve solenoids, and there's other clever aspects to it that we'll study when we switch over to a different simulation called interactive PWM graph. And so here we have now just the waveform moving by from left to right as time goes by. We start off with 0.5 hertz. That's clever for some discussions, but let's just make it really simple for a moment and move it to about one hertz. That means that we're operating where we have one complete full voltage and zero voltage happening 
every second, okay? Not great for the dimmer. I think we're going to notice some, some serious blinking on and off if we use that, but it's handy for, for basic study, especially if I pause that waveform now, freeze time, and you can see very clearly that inside of that one second period is the complete waveform, full voltage and zero. Now for driven loads, the amplitude can be important, and for hydraulic valves, typically a lot of industrial control equipment where we might trigger uh, a valve solenoid might be driven with a top amplitude of 24 volts. Well, if we're at a duty cycle of about 50%, which we are now, we're on half the time, off half the time, what we could see is that our average output is somewhere around the halfway mark and is similar to what we'd have if we'd only sent 12 volts to our valve solenoid. And so our valve solenoid might have only traveled halfway. And you might be asking, what's wrong with just using some type of circuitry where we simply turn down the flat line voltage instead of all this on and off? Well, simply put, if we're only going to use a fraction of the maximum available voltage and stay in a steady on state DC, we're going to have to dissipate some energy for the half the voltage that we didn't use. And that's typically done with heat in a, in a control circuit. And so that heat now may require us to have a large heat sink. Um, we might need a fan to cool it. The circuitry gets complicated, large, expensive. So PWM has some real advantages for the driven load. Just while we're in this simulation, let's change the... Um, Let's change the frequency again. Let's go all the way to, let's go all the way to two hertz and see what that looks like. So just to refresh our knowledge of hertz, hertz is always how many full cycles happen in a one second period of time. So if you're looking on that horizontal axis on the bottom of our graph where we depict time going by, where it says 1.0 seconds, we've now got twice as many full voltage segments and twice as many zero volt segments. We've packed two complete cycles of our waveform into one second of time, so that's two hertz. Okay? The hertz is typically, the, the frequency is typically selected in advance by machinery designers, and so it's not something that changes. The most commonly changing value is duty cycle for PWM systems. All right, so all of the examples I've shown you so far are for driven loads, and perhaps we've got another one over here that we could have a look at. We've got a little electric motor, and we're going to control the speed with pulse width modulation. Right now, if we look at the scope meter that is keeping track of the signal to that electric motor, we could see that we're at a 15% duty cycle off 85% of the time, on only 15%, and that's giving us the speed that you see here. If I go ahead now to our controller, where it does say 15%, and I start to increase the duty cycle, we see that our on time percentage is increasing, and go back to the motor, and we can certainly see that our motor is speeding up. So that's an example again, of using pulse width modulation to control a load device, this time an electric motor. But that's not the only use for pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation also shows up as a clever way to communicate sensor values to an electronic controller of some type. Here's an electronic controller out of a large piece of mobile equipment. Lots of electronic programming inside of it. Best that we don't pass too much current through that type of electronic controller. It likes very small current signals, small voltage for that matter. And so here I've got a whole array of sensors. Now we've kind of switched. We've gone from using pulse width modulation to drive a load to pulse width modulation to communicate, communicate data or a value. This particular sensor I'm holding is an angle sensor, and if you're watching on the right scope meter, watch the upper of the two horizontal traces, and as I'm rotating the lever, 
you'll see that right now we're at about 90% duty cycle. Check the duty cycle number in the top left corner of the scope meter. And of course by graphic depiction you can see that it is indeed about 90%. And as I rotate the lever, our on time decreases, our off time percentage increases, our duty cycle is going down. And typically most sensors of this type will have to operate in numbers between perhaps 5 and 95% is typical because 0 and 100% don't work. The controller says, hey, I don't sense, the sig I don't sense a, a signal coming in from a sensor anymore. The, the pulses that are being expected at a certain level of hertz or frequency have gone away. So 5 to 95% is typical for a lot of sensors. Okay, that's an angle sensor. Here I've got another one that would go right inside a hydraulic cylinder and would help us keep track of where the cylinder is in terms of its extension. The magnet that's here in the middle, that's typically mounted on the back of the piston inside the hydraulic cylinder. And as the cylinder extends, yeah, let's watch the, the lower of our two horizontal traces there on the scope meter now. As the cylinder extends, we can see the duty cycle increasing. There I am at about 95%. On time, only 5% off. And if I slide it all the way back towards the electronics unit, we can see that we're now down at a very low duty cycle, only 4%. And of course, this is just, this is just data. You know, the programming inside the controller has to have some, some, some programming done to interpret the range of duty cycle and correlate that to a table of, of values for the distance that this hydraulic cylinder might extend, whatever length that might be. Some other pulse width modulation sensors might show up inside the operator's cabin as control levers or as the throttle position sensor under the pedal. Even some heat and temperature sensors are using pulse width modulation. That's a typical set of applications for PWM. What are your thoughts? Do you have some questions? So that oscilloscope looks pretty familiar. It looks kind of like my multimeter I have. Can I make the same measurements on my multimeter? Yeah, you, you can actually. That's a good question, Chris. The, um, the, the typical multimeter, which costs a little less than the scope meter, scope meeters are up in the thousands of dollars. Uh, tip, a good quality multimeter will cost less than a thousand. And a good multimeter, if you're in the voltage DC range, will often have a setting, a button that allows you to select hertz versus percentage. Hertz for checking the health of the sensor to see if it's still there, to see if, uh, if the, the frequency that you're expecting is still coming. Um, for a lot of these types of sensors that I was showing you for industrial applications, 500 hertz is the typical frequency that's been chosen. That wasn't me. Industry selected that, and that's a typical. So having the ability to check on the health of the sensor and see that it's still putting out approximately 500 hertz, that can be handy. Pressing that button again to percentage, and the multimeter will often tell you the duty cycle. Just numbers, you'll lose the graphical waveform, that nice representation of the waves, but at least you've got your numbers and uh, the multimeter gets that done. So look for that in the instruction manual for a multimeter. A lot of people have that and don't even know the features there in the meter. Good question, Chris. How can you tell whether a sensor produces an analog or PWM signal? Yeah, well, that can get a little tricky. Um, you know, a, a potentiometer, a variable resistor, typically has three wires, and so does this PWM sensor. And with this rotating shaft, it, it kind of looks a lot like a a potentiometer that would be used to send a straight analog signal like you're mentioning. And uh, just by looking at it from the outside, unless these color codes for these wires mean something, you might not know. And in fact, if I remember right, there was a time, um, perhaps uh, 20 years back, where this exact packaging was actually being used with a variable resistor and did not have uh, pulse with modulation electronics inside it. So if you were to hook up your multimeter in resistance mode and do some tests, it might show as being utterly dead 
for a typical resistance potentiometer type of test and without the schematic or the part number to tell you that it's not a potentiometer, it's being powered by voltage on one of these three wires from the, the machinery system and that one of them is the signal ground and another one is the actual data signal out, you might not know. So yeah, that's a good question. It would be best to, to know in advance from a parts list or from a schematic diagram that this three-wire device is indeed a powered pulse width modulation device and then be able to set your instruments to measure it correctly. Now if I was on uh, do doing diagnostic work on such a machine and I wasn't getting a reading and nobody could provide me with a schematic, I might go back and forth between trying to measure it as a, uh, as a potentiometer for straight analog or I might try to just see if it's spitting out a PWM signal and try to figure it out that way. Good question. You had mentioned using pulse width modulation to drive a solenoid, but wouldn't the constant on-off be a problem for collapsing the magnetic field? Well, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, for that's another one that kind of speaks to the frequency chosen as well. And so if, this, if the frequency is low enough, I have an older amplifier here on the hydraulics equipment that we looked at at first, only at 30 hertz. And so there actually was a pulsing to the hydraulic hose, but more commonly now the frequency is quite a bit higher. Some hydraulic valves um, with a solenoid receiving a, a PWM signal, the frequency can be 75. We see some at 200, but we even encounter some that are 2000 or 2 kilohertz. Even have some here in our own lab where 14 and a half, 15 kilohertz is being used. And so with that higher frequency, the off time is such a short duration that the spring inside can't really drive the valve back to where it was. There's probably not even enough time for the entire magnetic field to collapse. You might not even sense any vibration at all. So is there any disadvantages for using pulse width modulation for data transmission? If it was data, as in computer data, I don't think this would be a good choice. Because relatively speaking, compared to what you could do with data on a CAN bus network or other types of computer data networking, this is pretty slow. But if you're just needing to reliably send a one signal value at a time over a distance of wire to a electronic controller of some sort that's expecting that signal, this is pretty good method for getting it done and adequately fast. Hey, great questions, everybody. You know, while there's more facets to PWM and other aspects to study, that gives us an introduction to PWM being used for the two major functions of power or driving loads versus communications. I hope you picked up some useful tips from that.